Well, good evening and welcome to the great Canadian conversation about AIDS in Africa with Stephen Lewis. We're so glad to see you here tonight. You have dared to get out on a crisp November evening, the very end of this month, a school night, a special evening. We are just two days away from World AIDS Day, which is December 1st. And before I get to Stephen Lewis, who as part of his dare has been giving interviews all day long. How many, Stephen? Seven. I have a few words about the project that brought us here tonight. The Stephen Lewis Foundation supports grassroots organizations working to curb the onslaught of HIV AIDS in Africa. It seeks out small community-based organizations and gives them initial grants of between ten and $35,000. And then as those organizations grow in strength, the funding grows with them. Since 2003, the foundation has funded more than 300 projects in 15 countries, from education about HIV prevention to the distribution of food and medicine to home care to support for orphans and other vulnerable children and to grandmothers left to raise them. Among the most recognizable of fundraising and organizational efforts that you may know about are the Grandmothers to Grandmothers campaign. There are now 240 groups of Canadian grandmothers supporting African grandmothers and their grandchildren. And in fact, the Afrigrand caravan that triggered this event this evening was a cross-country trip, a caravan on a 43-community tour from St. John's, Newfoundland, through Sackville, New Brunswick, Kenora, Ontario, Red Deer, Alberta, Nanaimo, BC, many other places in between, to Victoria. There were questions at every stop, and tonight's questions to Stephen are representative of the questions that were asked as that caravan made its way across the country. As well, the Stephen Lewis Foundation has launched a project called a dare to remember .com, urging us all to find our inner dares and then head off and confront it in an act of solidarity with those many individuals in African countries who confront their own issues of courage every day as they live with HIV AIDS. And in confronting your dare, the hope is that you will raise some support to confront AIDS in Africa along the way. As I say, Stephen's dare has been to answer questions all day long, and now he's stuck with me here tonight to answer more. And we have gathered here to listen to the man. Stephen Lewis needs no introduction, so let me make this brief. His day job these days involves being chair of the board of the Stephen Lewis Foundation. He is also distinguished visiting professor of Ryerson University. He is a co-founder and co-director of AIDS Free World in the United States. His work with the UN has spanned two decades. He was a nonpartisan appointment, remember those things? A new Democrat appointed to be our ambassador to the UN by the progressive conservative prime minister, Brian Mulroney. He has been the deputy executive director of UNICEF. That was from 1995 to 1999. The UN Secretary General appointed him as his special envoy for HIV AIDS in Africa from June of 2001 until the end of 2006. And he may be a companion of the Order of Canada and the Pierce, and, a, and a, a winner of the Pearson Peace Medal. He may have more than 30 honorary degrees, but he is also a knight commander of the most dignified order of Moshe Shui, an honor bestowed upon him by King Letsi III, the monarch of the Kingdom of Lesotho. Sir Stephen Lewis, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We, uh, we really should travel together, <laughs> Anna Maria. Speaking of traveling, how many planes have you been on this month? This month? A goodly number because I was in and out of Africa and London this month. So I, I don't remember the exact number, but it was many. You're a busy man. We're Reasonably. really pleased that you're here with us tonight. I just mentioned that in 2001, you became the UN Secretary General Special Envoy on HIV AIDS and AIDS in Africa. You traveled the continent. You bore witness to the devastation wrought by AIDS. And I'd like you to read something that you wrote about those times. This is from your book, Race Against Time. We've edited it a bit. 
But <laughs> I've spent the past four years watching people die. Nothing in my adult life prepared me for the carnage of HIV AIDS. The pandemic of HIV AIDS feels as though it will go on forever. The adult medical wards of the urban hospitals are filled with AIDS-related illnesses, men, women, wasted and dying, aluminum coffins wheeling in and out in Kafkaesque rotation. In the pediatric wards, nurses tenderly removing the bodies of infants, funerals occupying the weekends, cemeteries running out of grave sites. No one is untouched. Everyone has a heartbreaking story to tell. Virtually every country in East and Southern Africa is a nation of mourners. It has changed somewhat, but not dramatically. Most of the countries of East and Southern Africa are still nations of mourners. And although the numbers of infections have reduced somewhat, and the numbers of deaths have reduced somewhat. The carnage remains extraordinary, and the struggle at the grassroots is overwhelming. And the reduction in funding, which is presently being felt on the ground across East and Southern Africa, portends the possibility of returning to the horrors of the late 90s and early years of this decade. And it has caused... Uh, terrific anxiety. I was in Johannesburg just a couple of weeks ago uh, moderating a discussion amongst Doctors Without Borders, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, all of their program officers from Mozambique, South Africa, Lesotho, Swaziland, Namibia, Zambia, and Malawi. And what emerged during the course of the discussion was their uh, remarkable concern that all they were doing would come to naught if we reverted to the underfunding and the deaths of 10 years ago. And that has become the struggle again. And that's one of the reasons why the work the Foundation is doing is so incredibly important, because as things are falling apart in the provision of drugs and the pursuit of prevention, we are able to sustain them on the ground at community level where it really means something in the lives people lead as they struggle for survival. Are you telling me that, that some people think they're seeing progress and so they're pulling back instead of marching forward with, with the help, that, that like the continued help, the, the, the maintenance and continued help that's needed? Uh, I have been told that, I'm sure this is my own technological deficiency, that... Uh, <laughs> It, it, it comes because of my molecular structure uh, <laughs> that, that uh, he has to change something. I was wondering, okay. I heard a little bit of static So there, did I. So we'll, I, I we'll assumed it was WikiLeaks. Let those watching and listening. It's that they're using the ostensible financial crisis as an excuse to flatline the funding or to reduce the funding. And what is ironic about it, brutally ironic about it, is that we are on the cusp of a breakthrough. It is possible to see that the virus might conceivably be subdued over the next 10 or 15 years if the resources continue to flow. But the fact that they're drawing back right at this moment in time when there are new preventive interventions emerging, where we know how to do the treatment, where there is a lot happening, it's, it's just so heartbreaking and it's so nuts that, that they would regard Africa as expendable at the moment when it could be reincarnate. And, and that's what's so depressing about it. And I... And I, and I must say, it really infuriates me. Uh, I, 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 uh, I did a lot of discussion today, as you mentioned, around uh, HIV and AIDS on various CBC radio programs at noon. And, and I was thinking as I was answering the questions and just, just reflecting on it, how, how 
enraged ones get. UNAIDS did a report in the last few days on what they call their epidemic update, UNAIDS being the coordinating agency for the United Nations, which, which uh, handles the response to the pandemic. And they tried to present this picture of progress when in truth there are in Africa 23 million people living with the virus. The huge and disproportionate number are women and girls to whom the response has been abysmal. We now apparently have, I was shocked by this number, 16 million orphan children, which is just astounding. Many countries with more than a million orphans, thank God there are the grandmothers, or I don't know what would happen to those countries. Thank, thank God we've, we've, we've uh, managed to pull it together that, that Ilana had the inspired brainwave. Ilana being our older daughter who runs the foundation, had the inspired brainwave to, to show solidarity with the African grandmothers and to respond to them. Uh, and, and then on top of everything else, there is this sense that for every person you put into treatment, there are two new infections. And the infections are overwhelmingly amongst women. So to pretend that we've made progress by comparing the year 2010 with the year 2000 is a kind of self-delusion. Of course, we've made progress over a decade, but if you look at it baldly now, I mean, this is a, this is a virus where we've had 60 million infections, over 25 million people dead. Next year will be 30 years into the pandemic, still no vaccine. Uh, I mean, to pretend that this has somehow turned the corner, the only place it's turning is at the grassroots where at community level things are happening, but at the major interventions amongst governments, no, it's still sordid. It's still squalid in the response. You talk about 16 million orphans. That would be essentially half the population of Canada. Yes, uh, it would be half the population of Canada. And that's a big jump. The last time they used the number was 14.6 million, and suddenly they use a number of 16.6 million, and 90% and of them are in Africa. So it's, it's, it's just mind-boggling. And these kids, Anna Maria, huh, th th these kids, they can't go to school unless they have school fees. They're fighting to find something to eat. They don't have a decent roof over their heads. They're stymied by the need for health care. They're consumed by grief when they pull themselves back and think of what has happened to them. They're traumatized uh, emotionally by the wrenching loss of one or both parents. And we treat it all in this uh, kind of cavalier, arithmetic, statistical gathering fashion. You know, 2010 was supposed to be the year of universal access for treatment, prevention, care, and support. I'm using the exact words. On treatment, we're 10 million people behind where we should be to keep them alive. On prevention, we haven't unleashed the full swath of the preventive interventions we know. And on care and support, we are behind everything because that's the neglected area except for the kinds of work that are done by the foundations and others at the grassroots because that's what caring is. That's what support is, dealing with these projects in the communities where they immerse themselves in sustaining each other's lives. You have often said that gender inequality drives the AIDS pandemic. Claudia from Halifax and Stella from Winnipeg sent us questions. They were amongst those who asked, what is the role of men, the grandfathers, the fathers, the young men? Don't they have to change their behavior for anything meaningful to happen? Yes, yes, they have to change their behavior. But that takes a very long time. It takes, it takes generations to change male sexual behavior in the face of the pandemic. And meantime, we're losing the women. It, the figures are really startling. You probably all heard them ad nauseum. But, but of the 23 million living with AIDS in Africa, 60% are women. And in the age group 15 to 24, the most vulnerable age group, where the numbers of infections amongst young women outnumber the numbers of infections amongst young men, something in the vicinity of 8 or 10 to 1 in many countries. That, that prevalence rate, that, that, that percentage is around 75 or 76 percent of all of those in that age group are young women and girls. So the vulnerability of women is overwhelming. It's because they have no sexual autonomy. 
it's because gender inequality is compromising their lives, and it's because sexual violence is untrammeled. And, and I think it should be said it's not just Africa. Sexual violence is a kind of contagion which we are now documenting, which seems to be sweeping the world in developed countries as well as developing countries. So whether it's intimate partner violence or marital rape or politically orchestrated sexual violence or sexual violence in conflict, we now know because of a stunning study done by Rachel Jukes in South Africa and a remarkable piece of work done by a woman named Charlotte Watts who's at the School of Tropical Medicine in the United Kingdom, we now know that the levels of infection as a result of sexual violence are two to three times the normal levels of infection. And there was just a report, God, it's unbelievable, out in the last 48 hours of a new study that was done on the province of Gauteng in South Africa, population roughly nine and a half million. It contains the capital Pretoria and the largest city, Johannesburg. 37% of the men interviewed said they had raped women. 78% of the men interviewed said they had engaged in violence of one form or another against women. 7% of them said they had participated in gang rapes. 25% of the women said they had been raped, and only one out of 25 rapes are reported. And, and I, I, I'm always clutched about, about the Stephen Lewis Foundation, and lest it be seen as, as sort of self-promotion for the foundation, but, but I want to tell you that one of the things I'm personally proudest about in the foundation, and that, that Ilana and Isa too and others in the foundation have so carefully and brilliantly etched is the creation of an institute for the prevention of sexual violence which is drawing women who work on the front lines, counselors across the continent together to move from project to project where sexual violence is really a problem and to train people about how you deal with sexual violence, how you handle the therapeutic interventions with the women, how you respond to the contagion in the community. And it's invaluable because it's not being done on the continent. All you have to do, as I've done, is to spend time in the Congo, God forbid, or, or, or talk about post-election sexual violence in Kenya, or watch the madman Mugabe rape the women of the opposition party simply because they were in the opposition, you see how urgent it is to find a response because the sexual violence accelerates the transmission of AIDS. So, so the women are compromised and sort of rendered in fatal position twice, not just once. Um, and and that, that's, that's serious. So those questions are important, and I, I missed answering them because I got caught up. But, but, but the truth is that the men seem to back away. I mean, it's not only that they themselves are predators, and the sense of male sexual entitlement is astounding, but the men are not engaged in the community. They are distant in the community. The cultural organization in many parts of the continent leaves everything for the women to do, whether it's gathering wood or gathering water or looking after the kids or sending them to school or maintaining the family or tilling the fields or ensuring household food security. Women are at the center of the continent. It's not to say men don't do work. They do, but they are not brought into the, into the fulcrum of the family and the community the way the women are. All you have to do is look at the people who do community care, home-based care, who go out into the villages and, and help those who are dealing with AIDS. Overwhelmingly, they're the women in the community. You know, you have given us several numbers just now. Yeah. And I'm watching you as you tell us this, and I'm watching how how you are as you talk about the, you don't you don't think of them as numbers you see faces oh, yeah. when you tell us those big numbers yeah of course of course I mean, who do you impossible. think of what do you see when you talk about these staggering numbers you see individuals well, tell us about them well <laughs> you see a little girl of 14 standing outside the uh, pansy hospital in Bukavu in the eastern region in the south Kivus of uh, the Congo and she uh, has just come to the hospital with her two little siblings her 
mother was raped in her presence and then killed in her presence. Her father was killed in her presence. She was then gang raped. And she's trying desperately to hold it together as she speaks to the one psychiatric social worker, the one psychiatrist or someone with psychiatric training at the Pansy Hospital, which is the gathering hospital, which the foundation deeply and devotedly supports, the one hospital which deals on a perpetual basis with sexual violence, constantly repairing the reproductive tracts of the women as they come to the hospital. And, and, you, and you look at this little girl, she's just standing there silently, the tears are running down her face, she's talking, it's, it's, it's as though she's immobile, impassive, but communicating without feeling. And, and you know that that's a country where there are 600,000 such cases since 1996, and the episodes keep repeating themselves, and the international community keeps pretending to be concerned, and the Security Council passes resolutions, and the largest peacekeeping force in the country, in the world, is mobilized in the Congo, and 12 UN agencies are on the ground. And I, I look at this one little girl. I meet women who were interviewed, who had been raped in Zimbabwe. I meet the women who are working on projects in South Africa, which really has a terrible problem, in inheritance of apartheid. I mean, let us understand, this is, a, this is almost a, 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 a necessary and inevitable inheritance of a fascist regime which oppressed and brutalized people so crazily, word necessary is inappropriate, but so crazily were people brutalized that, that in the aftermath, things fall apart and women are so vulnerable. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, you lose too many people. I, I, that, 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 I guess, is what I don't understand. It's as though individual lives are not of consequence. It's as though if you can say in a report there were 2,600,000 new infections this year compared to 3,100,000 new infections in 2004. Therefore, we've made great progress. Or you can say 1.8 million people died, but 10 years ago, 2.1 million people died. It's as though we're rendering people into some kind of abattoir of irrelevance and expendability. And, and I, I, don't, I don't understand that. I mean, the importance of dealing at community level the projects we're engaged in is that every life is important. No one writes off anyone because in a community you love each other, you embrace each other, you work with each other, and, and you grieve when someone goes. But in the capitals, in the Western donor communities, they sit and they... They, they, they work out these financial nostrums about why they can't give money to the Global Fund. Can I take a moment and tell you, the Global Fund at its replenishment conference two months ago wanted to have $20 billion over three years so that it could achieve the target of universal access for treatment, prevention, care, and support. And that meant putting another 9 or 10 million people into treatment and doing a great deal more. If they couldn't get the 20 billion, they asked for 17 billion in order to maintain the present trajectory of treatment and prevention, which adds people on in increments, not enough, but at least it's moving forward. And if that didn't happen, they wanted 13 billion just to hold things together where they are, which meant that if you wanted to add people into treatment, somebody had to die, but at least it would hold it as it is. And they end up with $11.7 billion. They're more than a billion short of the minimum, which means death in 2011, 12, and 13. There's no way around it. They're not going to have the resources to get the drugs out and to do the job. And, and it is as though it's of no consequence. So Sweden, Sweden, I mean with a social democratic heritage, for heaven's sakes, Sweden comes to the replenishment conference and announces it's not giving any money at all. It's decided the global fund isn't trustworthy. And Holland comes to the conference and says, we're cutting back dramatically, and their uh, dra drama is something to behold. They've almost eviscerated the money they're giving. Germany cuts back dramatically. The United States does not give what we expected from Obama. Canada goes up only marginally. So you end up with a billion dollars less, and 
behind that billion dollars are, are human beings. And you find trillions of dollars for financial bank bailouts and stimulus packages and wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and oil spills and terrorism. But, but you want an extra, you know, pathetic, microscopic portion and you can't get it. And I, what I don't understand, Anna Maria, is, is how people don't measure these things in lives. They measure it statistically. It infuriates me. I feel as I look at it now, in the wake of the recent UN report, that somehow we let these manipulators get away with it. That somehow they're persuading themselves and the world and the donors that progress is being made and they are lying. It's a tough word to lose, use, but I think they're lying. You are mad. I am mad. And they're lying because they want the money to continue this process and it's just not good enough. It counts in lives. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm disturbed tonight. <laughs> Uh, but that's a familial thing. Uh. You know, there are people across Canada like Ramanjit in Toronto, Melissa in Calgary, who send in questions about whether it's possible to make a difference in the fight against AIDS because of the kinds of things you outline right now. They raise the usual concerns about government corruption in Africa, doubts about whether funds get to people who need them, whether individual donations can make a dent in such a huge problem. What do you say? to Ramanjit, Ramanjit and Melissa? I think you say to Ramanjit and Melissa that they are right to ask the question, particularly around some of the corruption. There is some siphoning off of money. You'll notice I'm trying to restore my sense of equanimity and drawing back in a, in a, in a, in a, in a moderate and balanced way to so as not to disrupt the audience unduly. I, I apologize. I don't think the audience minds a little okay. disruption. I... I, um, I <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's fair to ask those questions and I think in terms of the provision of antiretroviral drugs and the preventive interventions, those questions are reasonable. Where they don't apply as much and where the contributions can make individuals feel useful rather than impotent is exactly the work at community level. Because if you look at the communities now compared to four or five years ago, some of the big projects, bigger projects we've been supporting, uh, Reach Out Mbuyu in Uganda or Consul Homes in Malawi or Umwayo Girls School in, in Zambia or Nyaka in Uganda, there, there, are, there are so many of them. The, the course of things over the five, four or five years, if you measure it, is just astounding. That's why we used the cut line, Anna Maria, of turning the tide on AIDS in Africa. Because we felt that the progress these communities and projects were making was so dramatic and so startling that if the resources could continue to flow, you really could turn the tide. And whether it was providing the care or the support or yoga, I remember when I was at Reach Out in Boya, they were doing yoga, I thought they were crazy, but I, I, uh, I, I, I observed it with appropriate deference. Uh, and, 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 they, and they do testing, and they do counseling, and they understand the, por the importance of nutrition and food. And, you know, the, the other thing I really like, I feel, I feel almost detached, I really like about the foundation, is that we've created a special fund, about a million and a half dollars, I think Isatu told me, uh, for the payment of home-based care workers, people who go out into the villages and do the work on the ground to sustain the community. People like to say they're volunteers, but they're, they're really conscripted labor, and it's important that they be paid. And we've put aside another fund of a million dollars just to build homes for grandmothers who live in ramshackle environments that are falling apart, so their orphan kids, five, 10, 15 kids are, are feckless and frantic. And, and this kind of intervention, which you see moving year by year as the projects take hold and as the foundation assesses it and understands where next to go and what to do, it, it's, it's remarkable. People are filled with such 
hope and almost ebullience as they see that they can hold it together at the community level. Well, what are those, you're telling us a little bit about um, uh, uh, how that works. What do those communities look like? How big are they? Oh, they can be a community of uh, many thousands of people, 15 or 20,000 people in a, in a given contained geographic area, sometimes smaller. But you can have uh, situations where you have three or 4,000 people in treatment and then you have a whole larger number who come to be tested and counseled and you want to do grief counseling, you want to provide schools for the orphan kids, you want to make sure that the orphan kids have some counseling themselves because they really need it and it's, it's invaluable. And those <coughs> kinds of projects, when they are, when they are extended through the community, grow in size, they add thousands to it, but they, they, they function because they're rooted in the community, because the local people run them. And they, the money doesn't get siphoned off in the process of getting down. We put it right into the bank accounts of the community projects themselves. And, and there's a great uh, joie de vivre about it. I remember Consul Homes is a, is a project in Malawi which has very large numbers of orphan children. And they have organized themselves into clubs and into a kind of parliamentary system. And the kids are running the homes and they're, they're in many, many communities. And there is a, a kind of badge of honor to be a part of Consul Homes. So at the grassroots, that, that's what the big shots miss. And by the way, the big shots are always men. I mean, that, that, that's the bane of the pandemic that the men have been, have been handling it. Let, let, me, let, let me just tell you what I shouldn't tell you, but I'll tell you anyway. I got an invitation about two weeks ago to join an advisory group which is planning AIDS 2031, which will be, um, which will be sorry, AIDS 2011, in the middle of 2011, but it'll be 30 years into the pandemic. And it's being held at Harvard. And there are 14 on that advisory committee to plan. 13 men and one woman. And it is a woman's pandemic. That's where the vulnerability is felt. So you get Michelle Sidibe, head of UNAIDS. You get Michelle Kazachkin, head of Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. And you get Tony Fauci, head of the National Institute of Health. And you get everybody who is a male running these joints. And on the ground, the change is not happening, and the women are not present. And, and I, uh, it's, I, I can be um, confessional in this. I've been, in a sense, complicit in this. You know, you, 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 you just take on some of these roles when the roles should be taken on by the women. The women have so often been excluded. Who do we think of in Africa when we're thinking of women who have been leading the fight? The names on these top echelons don't come to mind, but they are in the villages. They are the, they are the Sapiwe Chlopis of, of, of Swapo that work in Swaziland. They're the Doris and Yangos who, who, who work in Kenya. They're the women on the ground who make the difference, but they never make it to the celestial climbs of the male planners. It's interesting. We don't realize how many women within these communities who uh, have turned things around for literally for their neighbors. Yes. That, that, that doesn't make its way into right. the grand halls and the... And they don't year make anniversary. The, right, and they things. don't make it into the planning. They're the only people who understand, not the only, but they, they have a more profound grasp of what's happening, and they're never invited. So I've got to write a letter now to, uh, to uh, Julio Frank, former Minister of Health in Mexico, uh, head of the School of Public Health in Harvard, a friend, a friend. I'm losing friends left and right. Anyway. Well, this matter. is being webcast, Stephen, and you know about WikiLeaks. Nothing is sacred, so I was it's say, out there. Uh, uh, this will be all over. My, my days are numbered, but... Um, I have to write Julio a letter in the next couple of days and say, Julio, I'm not joining your advisory group because this is, this is just wrong. And, and it happens all the time in every area of HIV and AIDS. There is this male hegemony, and someday someone's going to have to sit down. I have a, I have a you mentioned uh, uh, AIDS Free World in your introduction. I have a, a co-director who's often reminded me 
that that all these men who've overseen the pandemic for the last 30 years, look at where we stand today. And, and I'm telling you, it's, it's largely because, not just because of the reality of gender inequality, but because somehow the women have been excluded from making the decisions and handling what is, what is going on. And that's not an accident. I mean, that's the, that, the way the world works is not an accident. It, male hegemony run riot, and it is brutal. You mentioned the number of orphans, 16 million, you said, children orphaned by AIDS. And there was a question from Janet in Fredericton and from Ron in Victoria and from many others who wanted to know if orphanages or international adoptions are solutions for what you have called a continent of orphans. What do you suggest? They're neither of them solutions. The orphanages tend to be antiseptic and clinical in their relationship to the children. They will say to you, we embrace them, we love them, we give them infection. But when you visit the orphanages, there's a sense of, uh, of distance and uh, the children are to some extent isolated. And, and to be fair, it's very hard for the orphanages. I mean, if absolutely everything else falls through, you might have to have an orphanage. But it is not a substitute for an extended family or for communities supporting the children, or even in some instances, child-headed households, which will give siblings more support than an orphanage would give. International adoptions, look, if a country like Ethiopia or a country like, well, Ethiopia supports international adoptions. If you want to adopt kids, the easiest route uh, in Africa is, is Ethiopia. If uh, you're Madonna, you can go to Malawi. Um, uh, there aren't many other countries that provide support for international adoptions. It's not an answer. What, you're going to adopt maybe a couple of hundred kids if, uh, if, if people get together and really take it on? We're talking about 16 million orphan children. We have to find a way of dealing with the orphans in their own countries, in their own cultures, where they can be most secure, where they can learn and prosper and thrive bringing them to North America, to Western Europe, it, it may work. I don't want to say it won't work. You can't be absolute about it. And there are some people who deeply, deeply want to adopt African children. And if it's not against the government regulation, they're entitled to do so. But believe me, it is no answer. It is no answer at all. It is just the response to a small handful, relatively speaking, of individuals. Well, this brings us to the grandmothers. A lot of the questions came from people um, who attended events during the Afrogrand caravan, the cross-country tour, by three sets of African grandmothers and teenage granddaughters. This, this speaks to your focus on women, right? Yes. The, the grandmothers who are there with the children. Yes. And, and you know, <coughs> the grandmothers... I mean, we know how they have emerged in the 240 or 250 chapters across Canada, and we know that Canadian grannies have gone to Africa and African grandmothers have come to Canada, and there's this lovely solidarity. But what I love about it, Anna Maria, is that it is beginning to approximate a social movement, that there is a sense of a social force emerging from the grandmothers which transcends their individual activities. And, and it's exciting and it's thrilling and people talk about it all over. I went to a conference on care and support in London two to three weeks ago and on the floor during question period, people were asking about grandmothers. And at the International AIDS Conference in Vienna last July, people were asking about grandmothers and you could see that the grandmothers had become a kind of centerpiece in the response. But you see what is true of grandmothers is they're at the community level. This is your... This is your iconic representation of what community means. The grandmothers are at the heart of it. You go to Cape Town in South Africa and you meet with, the, with GAPA, Grandmothers Against Poverty and AIDS. They are hilarious, uh, voracious, uh, carnivorous, I think. They go after <laughs> me. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's extraordinary. And they're, they are so resilient and lively and determined to look after their orphan grandchildren. I mean, you dare not get in their way. And they do a really beautiful job. Uh, I mean, they sustain each other. It's so, so touching. You know, I remember, I remember when we started with the grandmothers 
we chose the grandmothers, if memory serves me, first from Alexandria Township, just outside Johannesburg, where there was a particular project. And I, I remember I was there on, on one occasion uh, with Alicia Keys and Angelique Kijo. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, to uh, embellish my legitimacy with the uh, audience. <laughs> and and we, we sat and talked with the grannies for the longest time, and there were some of them, two or three of them, who just wouldn't communicate. They just wouldn't talk. And when we chatted with the rest of them sitting under a tree, I remember, for hours and hours, and they told us about what the trouble was with these other two or three grannies. They, they had, in succession, buried all their children. I mean, it was one grandmother who had buried her five adult children in three years. I mean, how do you, how do you function in life? How do you, how do you survive? And, and she couldn't speak because it was all too traumatic. It was all too eviscerating. And... And yet, and yet, when the grandmothers are together, when they're sitting side by side, when they're eating together, when they're talking together, when they're at home together, when they're supporting each other, it's a beautiful thing to watch. And, and I love the fact that we're so engaged with the grandmothers because in countries like Namibia, Botswana, even Mozambique, 40 to 60% of the orphans are looked after by the grandmothers. I remember when I was um, in the International AIDS Conference in Vienna and I was up in a luncheon room and uh, I suddenly saw the Minister of Health in Namibia, a fellow called Richard Camway, who's really a very unusual Minister of Health and a, and a lovely guy who, who fought with SWAPO during the anti-apartheid wars and was tortured and, 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 and is a man of immense integrity and principle. And, and he came over to me and he sat down at lunch. We had a lunch together. We're good friends and we were chatting. He said, Lewis, he never calls me Stephen, he says, Lewis, those grandmothers, you were telling me about those grandmothers. Lewis, they're saving Namibia, Lewis. I want you to know they're saving the country. And, and it was uttered with such heartfelt uh, zeal. And, and he talked so uh, admiringly and affectionately about how the grandmothers in so many communities were holding it together because there was nothing else, you know. Nothing and there else. are still no grandmothers invited to that Harvard meeting either, are there? No, of course not. They're women. But this is the, the, ba this is the balance issue because you, you talk about what goes on on the ground, but you do need those billions coming from yes, governments as yeah. well in tandem yeah. with what the grandmothers do through their own resources and the help of smaller foundations. Interestingly enough, in the UNAIDS report, they pointed out that 52% of the funding for low and middle income, response, middle income country response comes from the country themselves. So in fact, in many countries now, the majority of the dollars that are going to deal with HIV and AIDS are coming out of the treasuries of those countries. That is quite a change. They're taking it more and more seriously. And it's important to remember that out of the roughly billion people on the African continent, 700 million are living on less than a dollar and a quarter a day. So the poverty is not just endemic, it's pulverizing. And yet they're managing to find money to deal with the pandemic. In the very low income countries, they are reliant, understandably, on external aid. And it's that aid which is going down. And, and what is if I can just shift slightly to a more optimistic note, but to show how the lack of resources may compromise the optimism, we have a number of preventive interventions which are proving to be hopeful. We have now a microbicide. Uh, that's a cream or a gel or a foam which is vaginally applied and can prevent transmission of the virus. And for the first time on a study in South Africa, we have a microbicide which is showing a 50 or 54 percent effectiveness in stopping transmission. That's astounding. There's never been anything more than 2 or 3 or 4 percent. It suggests that in further trials, the women will finally have a preventive intervention that can give them sexual autonomy, which is really what it's all about. 
we know that male circumcision reduces transmission for the man by up to 60%. That's quite amazing. We know now that people who are put on antiretroviral treatment as soon as they test HIV positive, if that is rolled out in significant numbers, then treatment becomes prevention. What happens is that when you treat people, the viral load in their body is lowered to undetectable levels, and if they engage in unprotected sex, the virus is not transmitted. So treatment becomes prevention, and we have on top of that something called pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is relying on one or two of the antiretroviral drugs given to men who have sex with men even before they are infected to prevent the possibility of infection. And a recent series of trials in several countries reported on just 48 hours ago showed a transmission reduction of 44%. Now this is, this is amazing, these series of potential significant preventive interventions and they're all possibly dying on the vine, including a quest for a vaccine, because the funding is drying up. And all of these interventions are ultimately given to women as beneficiaries because they form the majority of the pandemic. There's a question from Amanda in Summerside and Abdul in Guelph who wanted to know about what inspired you to start the foundation and what you have learned. You know, if I could go back right to the roots, it, 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 it goes again to, uh, to the... Uh, co-director I mentioned earlier, I was, in, I was in Kenya and I was, it was 2003, I think, and I was beside myself at what I had seen. And I was visiting Nairobi where many UNICEF colleagues and others working on AIDS lived and I'd stopped off to spend time and I was really, I was in a bad mood, unlike tonight. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and uh, the, the, a very, very good friend, a good friend of the family, Paula Donovan, said to me, I remember the words well, stop whining, form a foundation, raise some money, do something about it. So I thought that wasn't a bad idea. <laughs> and, and I came back and I, I remember thinking, I'd like to start a foundation and who will run the foundation? Well, there's this Elena Landsberg Lewis. She's selling her soul to the United Nations in New York working for UNIFEM, a small UN women's agency, uh, which, wasn't, uh, which was trying very hard but never had any resources, typical, a women's agency. And Ilana had been doing some pretty important work and is a human rights lawyer by training. So I pleaded with her to come back to Toronto and, and help to form the foundation. And she said, yes. I mean, I will forever be indebted. And she came back and she had this uh, crazy, uh, yes, good. She's right over here. She had this crazy, primitive, Lincoln-esque log cabin view of what you do when you create a foundation. You find a kitchen table and you do it around the kitchen table, and you think maybe if you're lucky you'll raise two hundred or $250,000. And you put your dad on a plane every other day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what you do is you get rid of your father, who is a, who is a perceptible pain. And, and then suddenly people rallied to the cause. I mean, it's just indescribable the way Canadians showed their generosity. And, and really without trying unduly, but just with really inspired organization, uh, millions of dollars came in. At this point, Anna Maria, the foundation has raised over $60 million, really since 2004. It's, it's uh, phenomenal. And, and it's, it's, it's mostly from individual Canadians. It's, we don't get money from government. Uh, I mean, anyway, this government, who, who would want their money? And, and, uh, and, and, and we... Uh, uh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, I should have provoked you more. Uh, and, and, and we don't get all that much from the corporate world. We, we do get some from family foundations and other foundations, but it's mostly individual Canadians who have supported the foundation. Are you surprised at that? Are you surprised at the response from, uh, look at the people here tonight. I mean, are you surprised at what the reaction people have to the foundation and to hearing you talk about these things? These aren't, this isn't an easy subject. No, 
it's a Monday night. There are things to do. There are kids to put to sleep. They're here tonight. They want to hear you. What, what, what do you make of, of how your fellow Canadians respond to what you are so passionate about? You know, you know what I what I make of it, and it has and it has bewildered me as I looked at other, particularly G8 governments that I know best. The passion, the generosity, the feeling, the intensity of the feeling amongst the population at large is much greater than amongst the political leadership. And I find that odd because this is an issue which if you take it unto politics, you could make a contribution so telling, so important that the whole world would applaud. I mean, people ask themselves, why didn't we win a Security Council seat? We didn't win a Security Council seat because we're withdrawing from the world. We're, we're not making ourselves felt as Canadians often did in the past. And, and it's just fascinating to see at the grassroots in Canada how intense is the feeling when one conveys what is going on and talks honestly about it and sometimes with anecdotes and individual examples. But I can't, I mean, I will admit it, you can't, I can't get through to the politicians. I certainly can't get through to the politicians in the government and I, uh, as, one, as one person. And, and, you know, I spent, um, I spent three or four days, three weeks ago, Anna Maria, lobbying British members of parliament, uh, conservatives and liberal Democrats and Labour, uh, who belonged to the All-Parliamentary Committee on Africa and the All-Parliamentary Committee on HIV AIDS. Then I saw a number of them individual. I was lobbying them on giving more money to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria because of the shortfall, and they haven't made their final calculation yet, and lobbied them to give uh, a good deal of money to this new international women's agency we've created, UN Women, uh, with Michelle Bachelet, the former president of Chile, as the head of it, which is very exciting, a feminist socialist as head of a UN agency, you, you think there'd be cardiac arrests all over the place, and, and, and there weren't. Uh, it's, it's thrilling uh, what happened. And, and I, I, I saw that when you sit the politicians down and you talk to them one-on-one -on -one over and over again, this is what advocacy is all about, um, you, you, you make some inroads, but... but Fundamentally, the, it's the ideology and the political realpolitik which dictates the response. It's rare that you get a response which is heartfelt and feeling. It's more a calculation. And people in Canada, they don't calculate. They simply respond with their hearts. And so far, they've been incredibly generous. Well, you know, in line with that, we have a question from Neil G. in Sudbury and Kim in Red Deer who said, in, ab in the absence of a cure or access to affordable drugs or a vaccine. How can individuals and governments build an HIV-free generation? I think by spreading the word, raising awareness, raising consciousness, um, making contributions to uh, individual foundations uh, like our own, but also to the terrific NGOs that work on the ground. I mean, there are some some wonderful non-governmental organizations. There's Doctors Without Borders and World Vision and Care and Save the Children and AMREF. I mean, all of these groups do work on the ground. So you make a decision in your own mind. I've never felt dogmatic about it. Do you want to give uh, contributions to groups which actually have their own staff on the ground? Or would you prefer to make a contribution to a foundation like our own which takes the money and puts it right into the community where the people themselves will make the decisions and do the work. And, and those, are, those are alternative choices. But to talk about it, to get engaged in it, to read the material, to, to volunteer, to bring neighbors and friends together, to uh, have uh, African grandmothers come to schools, community centers, rotaries, trade unions, churches, I mean, that's the way you make a contribution, whether you're in Sudbury or in, or in uh, Red Deer. Most extraordinary two communities that come to that question. It's, it's kind of odd, but, uh, uh, but I, I won't embellish that. Uh, <laughs> Bev in Regina and Polly from Cranbrook were two of many who wanted you to address the issue of why Canadians should be supporting organizations in Africa working on AIDS when there are so many press, pressing issues here at home? Because in this country we should be able to do both. I think it's as simple as that. Because when you have a country that... <laughs> when, 
when you have a country that is as privileged and favored as we are, it should be possible to work on First Nations reserves, to work in areas that are impoverished, uh, and still make a contribution to Africa. I mean, child poverty in this country continues to accelerate. We've just had a report in Ontario that child poverty went up a significant percentage. It now stands at over 15% of children below the poverty line in, the, in one of the richest jurisdictions in the world. That is obviously untenable and unconscionable. It should be possible to do something about Ontario and something about Aboriginal peoples where you have another distinctly vulnerable group and yet at the same time at the same time, honor your commitment to humankind, to the human family, uh, to recognize that this privilege and favor deserves to be expressed beyond ourselves. I don't see any difficulty in that. Where is the challenge in Canada, the greatest challenge in Canada for HIV AIDS? On the Aboriginal uh, reserves. Did I just uh, do something which was... I, we oh, can still, still hear you. Okay. We're good. <laughs> um, I, don't know, I don't know why this is happening, but it is predictable. Um, <laughs> on the First Nations reserves, there is significant reason to believe, not yet epidemiologically documented as it should be, that the prevalence rates are pretty high. Clearly, in the downtown east side of Vancouver where we have the safe injection site, the numbers of Aboriginal persons who are being infected through injecting drug use, that's very high. There is also some incremental increase in the number of women who are infected in Canada. So Canada is showing the same patterns as other developed countries. It's rather interesting that no one's making big claims about the diminution in numbers as a result of work in the developed world. Because in Canada... The United States, the United Kingdom, Japan, the numbers are still going up. Is he okay I, I, with sound or do we need a, an intervention? Well, we, we, oh, is that me? Maybe I'm doing that. It's, a, it's an anesthetic I need rather than a... <laughs> I think I'm okay now. <laughs> I, uh, Can you blue sky with us for a moment? Nick from Kingston asked, what would you do if you had the fortunes of Bill Gates? I don't want the fortunes of Bill Gates. I, I worry a lot about Bill Gates. And it's not, uh, no, and it's not because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm envious, although I writhe in night, at night with rivalry. Uh, uh, but I... <laughs> I worry, I worry about one foundation like the Gates Foundation setting the agenda for global public health. I mean, I really think there are concerns there, and I think some of his judgments are questionable, and I certainly think some of the sources of his investment wealth are questionable, uh, as the Los Angeles Times has done a really fascinating uh, expose on the investment practices. But, you know, on balance, he's on our side, and I really am happy for that. And I honor what he and Melinda Gates do, because they seem to work quite well in tandem. Um, you know, if one had the riches of a Bill Gates, which, by the way, exceeds in annual uh, disposal of income, the Canadian International Development Agency, just by the way, um, Bill, Bill Gates, I would love to use that money in slightly unorthodox ways. I would plow it into a search for a vaccine as though there's no tomorrow. I would plow it into the other preventive measures like microbicides. These people are fighting for resources to prove in their trials what we know will save millions of lives and they are having trouble raising the money that is completely and totally crazy. Now to be fair to Bill Gates, he has done some of that but not enough with the money he has. I would pour it into the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria and I would make a case 
for the groups that are working at the grassroots at community level to have secure financial resources so that we could be exponential in our embrace of turning the tide so it wouldn't have to be clutch by clutch and community by community. Uh, and, and I could see, I mean, apart from that, I, I could see uh, leadership in advocacy around the issue. You know, I'm going to admit something now that I've never admitted on a public platform before. The one real disappointment I have in life, I don't have many, I've had a wonderful life, but the one real disappointment I've had in life is that I've never had the opportunity to head a UN agency. I've always wanted secretly to be able to, to head an agency and show the world what can be done. But in the realm of the United Nations, uh, you know, Canadians uh, don't always get to, I mean, these agencies are parceled out geographically and by uh, national right, like the United States will always have UNICEF, will always have the World Bank, will always have the World Food Program. I mean, these are given to certain countries. You can't break those monolithic patterns. But I've often thought everything in the multilateral system is hierarchical. If you have energy and vision at the top, you can change the world at the bottom. And we have lacked energy and vision. When people said to me today, one of the things about WikiLeaks was that they were asking for Ban Ki-moon's DNA. I thought, well, why not? They want to see whether he has a pulse. And it's a... <laughs> and, 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 and that, that, that I, I can understand. I mean, there is... There is That's uh, why no one gives you, you an agency to run. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you might be right about that. Uh, but I, I, I just know that, that if you had the money of a Gates and, the, and there is now a new head of, uh, of, of UNICEF who's first rate and Michelle Bachelet of UN Women is first rate, we're getting some of the leaders who can perhaps turn things around. You and the foundation talk about turning the tide of HIV AIDS in Africa. Derry from Comox, Karen from Burnaby have asked, what actions of ours matter most to the African people? Oh, I think the, uh, uh, at least as I've been able to discern it, I think it's the trust, the sense of genuineness, sincerity, respect. They love the way they're treated. The, the, the extraordinary sensibility of the foundation, it's sort of the culture of the foundation of pe treating the recipients with respect, responding instantaneously when there's a terrible calamity like a wild outbreak of violence after an election campaign in Kenya when everything falls apart and people don't have food and they don't have medicine and, and the foundation just leaps on it and responds immediately and doesn't play around with delays and bureaucracy and, and affirmations but just goes in and does the job. But it's the, I, I love the correspondence that I read from, from members of the programmatic team and the others in the, in the foundation. The, 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 the way in which the writing is so heartfelt, so honest, so respectful. People don't treat recipients with respect. It's so interesting. There's a kind of Pavlovian colonialism which comes into play even in the best NGOs and agencies where they think because they're handing out the money they can order people around. And there is a, I don't even know how to, in the language of my people, there's, there's the word tum. It's, a, it's like a feel. Uh, uh, there, there, there's a sense that that this is an honest exchange. You can trust us as we trust you. You can respect us as we respect you. It's, it's a feeling of, of a genuine, heartfelt intimacy, which I've not seen in other uh, situations. And it does distinguish the foundation. I, I realize I'm saying something strong, which some people may feel is a little self-aggrandizing, but it's the part of the foundation I really love because the tone is so right and so respectful. And that's so important, Anna Maria, because it does not happen.
You know, I don't think any of us can sit here and watch you and listen to you without feeling the energy and the passion you have for this. But um, it's a lot. You're always on the road. You um, are always knocking on doors of politicians who don't want to see you. Um, and, and, um, and, and you do not listen to me. And, uh, and they hear things, with what, you, what you say about them when you're with people like us. Um, <laughs> what keeps you going? What is it? You don't have to do this, Stephen Lewis. You could retire. You could go to the cottage. Why True. do you do this? True. I do it because I'm part of a democratic socialist tradition which believes that the struggle for social justice and equality is the most important way of spending life. I do it because I'm surrounded by a family and by colleagues who believe the same things and support them. And I do it because, honestly, you can't go to Africa and visit the projects and interact with the people on the ground, particularly the women, without coming away feeling... I want to devote a large chunk of my life to this. This is just too important. These people are too wonderful. The, 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 the need is too great. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to the cottage except maybe a week in August. I'm, 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 I'm two weeks, sorry, honey. Two weeks in, uh, in August. Oh my God, I almost forgot. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, um, I, I, I think on balance, that's what, that's, that's what keeps me going. It's just really, you just feel sort of useful in the world. You know, you read this um, from your early days when you went through these communities and saw so much grief. And I know you see a lot of joy as well. And you talk about your family, but I'm guessing that all of those people are your family, that they never leave you. That's true. That's true. On one of the, on one of the um, Noonan phone hours sh- today, one of the Noonan call-in shows, I, <laughs> noon hour call-in shows, I, uh, I was asked by the host, um, was there a person, was there an image along the way which lived with me? And I, I, I got <laughs> um, embarrassingly uh, emotional because you know the way things stick in your mind? There, there was in Zambia when I first visited. I sat around a table led by a, a Zambian activist named Winston Zulu, a remarkable man who's worked closely with the foundation and, in fact, has been in Canada, had spent a year at Ryerson, has been an extraordinary man. He had polio when he was a kid. He's, he's disabled, uh, but he's also living with AIDS and he's living with tuberculosis and it's astonishing that he's alive and functioning and powerful. And he had drawn together a group of people living with AIDS. And I, th- there was one 25, 26-year-old woman who had lost the sight of an eye because of the ravages of the virus And she was so bright and she was so wonderful and she was so all sort of embracing and inclusive and touching and tender and smart as hell. And I went back to them five days later to report on what I'd found in the country and she was gone. She was just gone. And I didn't have to ask. It was unstated. Everybody knew. And yes, they be, I mean, people become family. They become an extension of yourself, you think this is what one should do in life. You know, this this just makes sense. Stephen Lewis, thank you. Thank you for the conversation. I just have a few things to say, but let, I'm going to let them continue. <laughs> We'd like to thank you all for taking the time to come here to listen to Stephen Lewis tonight. And for more information on the foundation, go to the website, stephenlewisfoundation.org. You can also link to the dares on that site, or you can go directly to adaretoremember.com. We want to thank everyone who sent in questions from the communities across Canada, from those doing the dares who also sent in their questions, along with everyone else who made this evening possible. And for all of you in our audience tonight, thank you very much for being here.